what I wanted to do this time was to just share with you very honestly what my problems were and how I've sorted them out because so often when I talk about manic depression or bipolar disorder so many people just like they cannot believe for a second that I was genuinely had the condition or that uh, you can you can correct it with diet that it's just like no way the doctors just said that's it you've got to be on drugs for the rest of your life so I'm going to share my story as part of the interview and then from the information side I'll be going into this issue in a lot more from the scientific perspective so so really just my story is uh, I suffered from probably today they'd call it attention deficit disorder I couldn't concentrate very well when I was a kid I had to always be thinking of other stuff I had a whole lot of stuff going on in my head all the time like my, my brain was hyperactive I, I, it was like racing and um, I found that I tended as a, a growing up to speak faster than most people around me people telling me to slow down not to speak so fast um, I would daydream, stare out the window, I was always lost in my thoughts. Um, it was just a, a, a big problem and it became, it started becoming really bad when I started suffering from depression. I didn't know it was depression, I started having suicidal thoughts when I was quite young and I remember asking um, my Sunday school teacher what would happen to me if I took my own life and I mean what do you say to a child who's 8 or 10 years old who says what will happen to me if I kill myself? what would you say I mean she said to me you go to hell now subsequently to that I've read the Bible from cover to cover and I know that that's not the truth I believe that God understands us so believe me I'm not judging anybody at this point it's just what I was told at the time but obviously to prevent me from going home and jumping off the roof I mean what do you tell a kid and so I had these mood swings that started getting worse and worse and as a young woman probably at the age 15, 16, 17 years old, I remember actually coming home from school on my bicycle thinking if I just shut my eyes and pedaled like mad, I would just crash into this bus that came around the corner at 3 o'clock every day and my life would be over. And I must tell you that I, I don't come from a family where I was abused as a kid. I was just a normal family. Um, there was no abuse. My parents were divorced when I was 10 years old, but it wasn't. Um, there was no, as I say, no, no emotional like disorders or anything. And I, I, I tend to be a pretty kind of grounded person. I'm not, I tend to get over things quite quickly. So there was nothing that I could say at this point. Somebody abused me or, you know, there was any kind of abuse from anybody. Um, I'm one of four kids. Second of four kids, uh, you know, I've an older sister and two younger brothers. So there was nothing, there was nothing in my past or my childhood that I could say. And not my, my brothers and my sister don't have the same problem. And so I found that these, these planned suicides, the one thing that stopped me was this thought that I could possibly end up in hell. And um, that wasn't a very nice thought. And so. I uh, would kind of shove this away and then just deal with it. But I also had to have these really crazy thoughts that went on in my head. I, I, I'd have days where I felt I could take on the world and that like I was, you know, nobody could conquer me and I would just like, I, I could, you know, do anything. I was capable of anything. And I had days where I could not get out of bed. I had days where I remember clearly not being able to get out of bed until 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I went on to meet my husband and we got married and I remember even when I had small children not being able to get out of bed in the morning and these kids with the, you know, wet, wet bums and, and poop bums used to climb all over me and I'd be like in the stupor in bed. It was like I was an alcoholic or something and I never consumed alcohol at all. And uh, it, it, it progressed. I mean, I used to have these really, really weird, crazy thoughts. And I'm not going to go into the detail of what some of those crazy thoughts were because they were pretty violent, violent, crazy, horrible, just dreadful, dreadful stuff that went on in my head. And um, I remember crying out to God with my health and with this issue after I'd collapsed, I'd actually collapsed in a store, I had 
my young, my oldest daughter Melissa was about three years old. I had her in the um, shopping cart, and fortunately she was in the cart, and I wasn't holding her, so she didn't fall down on the floor. And so um, I collapsed, and somebody kind of got me onto a seat, and eventually they got information out of me, and they called my husband and got me home and the doctor came and I remember in those days the doctor was still making house calls she came around and basically went through a whole procedure and uh, you know in trying to find out she basically got back to me and said look what I believe your problem is I believe you're suffering from a chemical imbalance of the brain called uh, in those days she said it was called manic depression today they call it bipolar disorder and that and I said, well, what can I do about it? She said, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to go on to medication for the rest of your life. And uh, basically gave me a script. And uh, I remember actually going and investigating. In those days, there wasn't any, um, there was no internet. So I had to go into a pharmacy and ask them for the insert and read the side effects of the medication that she was recommending. And... It didn't worry me that it was going to cause liver damage and heart problems and, and you know other kind of serious physiological problems. What worried me was that it would make me put on an inordinate amount of weight. And having come from a pretty much a family where most of the women are overweight in our family, I didn't want to take this drug that was going to make me fat. Because you've got to understand, at the time of my diagnosis, I was actually underweight for the first time in my life. And I was like, so here I was skinny and crazy. And... Um, I did some dreadful things. I mean, I would I would just jump in the car and drive off to nowhere and not tell my husband where I was going. He wouldn't know where I was going. I would I broke probably every breakable item that was in my kitchen. I don't have any wedding presents, so anybody who came to my wedding and brought me gifts 31 years ago, I'm sorry, I broke the gift. Um, but the good thing that's come out of it is that I sought answers for my health, and I believe that it can help many people out there. And for me, what happened is I asked God to help me because I, I just, I, I had exhausted every avenue. I didn't, and, and just, it was quite amazing. Somehow a book just landed in my lap called Sugar Blues by a guy called William Dufty. And he was describing me in the book. And he was talking about his life and how he had these mood swings and episodes of craziness and the stuff going on in his head and irrational thoughts and irrational behavior. and dangerous stuff really really dangerous stuff I mean I remember as a teenager doing really careless dangerous stuff after reading this book sugar blues I realized that I had a problem with sugar and I'll, I'll explain that more in in the section on science I just want to explain to you what I did to, that changed me that changed the way my brain was working is that I realized I was addicted to sugar and I didn't fully realize, I partially realized, I'd studied physiology and anatomy, so I understood the process of glucose in the body. I didn't realize that when your blood sugar fluctuates so violently and you get this reactive hyperglycemia, that it can have this very powerful effect on your brain and the way you think and the way you behave. So I started eating natural glucose and I started eating large quantities of fruit because I had cried out to God and asked him to really give me the wisdom because I didn't want to take this drug and show me what to do um, and, I, and I just felt you know I believe that God is, a, is, is very practical and that his solutions very often are very practical and I, I just felt this thought you know God doesn't speak to me audibly but it was like this thought that I had what would I eat if I was craving something sweet in the Garden of Eden and many of you have heard me ask that question and that's where it came from I climb the nearest date palm and buy, you know, eat all the dates. So it was pretty easy, you know. As a sugarholic, um, why not just climb, scale the nearest date palm? And so it made sense to me. I'd, I'd eat the dates, you know. I'd sit up on top of that date palm and eat the dates all day long. I'd eat the mangoes. I'd eat the really sweet grapes. I'd, and so that's what I started doing. And one day I ate like five pounds, which is like two kilograms of two and a half kilograms of, of fresh dates I, I know it was that much because I bought that much and by the end of the day they were finished um, I ate a box of mangoes eight or ten mangoes a day I ate watermelon I ate an entire watermelon I um, man I just I just ate 
I ate and ate and ate myself stupid when it came to fruit for a period of about three months. I just couldn't get enough fruit. And um, I woke up one morning and I just, I, I didn't have the shakes. It was about three months into it that I started eating fruit and trying to replace all the refined sugar with fresh fruit. I, I didn't have the shakes by eight o'clock in the morning. By nine o'clock I wasn't shaking. I wasn't hungry. I wasn't, I was always ravenously hungry. I just could never get enough food. And it was like, I wasn't hungry anymore. And you know, by probably nine, 10 o'clock, I decided to have a bit of fruit and a handful of nuts. And, and, I, and it was enough. It was like one mango and I've had enough. I didn't need the whole box. But I think the thing that really made the big difference to me is that I started to feel this amazing sense of hope and sense of purpose and focus that I'd never had in my life before. It was like somebody had flicked the switch on in my brain. It's like my brain had been in a fog for like, you know, 25 years of my life. Just this fog where I was just like not functioning and I was like, living in this thick fog and kind of wading through it and I'd find people in there sometimes and I'd occasionally find a lucid thought. Now it was like it was crystal clear. I mean, it was like I'd wake up and it was like my head was as clear as the sky is here. I mean, it's just like that crisp, clean blue color over there. And, and um, it's been clear for, for 25 years. Just, it's like that, it's like sharp. It's like the colors are sharp my brain is sharp as I said the sense of purpose the sense of focus uh, constant energy um, I, I just I, I can get back to that state of craziness it's pretty easy for me I can do two things I can consume alcohol or I can consume refined sugar and that is you know sweet and condensed more candy chocolate plain sugar cakes cookies anything with refined sugar I seem to tolerate honey really well I tolerate fruit exceptionally well um, I eat probably more fruit than most people do still but I still don't eat vast quantities anymore um, but this incredible sense of hope that I have on a daily basis where my brain works I can sit and concentrate for eight, eight hours at a time without having to get up and like go and do something else. I'm not, I'm not kind of all over the place. I don't feel like my brain is, it's like my brain used to fire like rapidly all the time. I feel like my brain is calm, but very efficient. Um, and for me, that's the most incredible thing. It's just, it's just so awesome. I just want to tell you that for me, I've never had to take the medication. My brain has worked consistently well for 25 years. Um, I've been set free from depression. I don't suffer from depression anymore. I, I, I've managed to write seven books and, and, and I've realized that I actually have a brain that works really well. How I ever got through school, I have no idea how my brain actually coped. Um, and and I, I just, for anybody out there who's got family or friends, I, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, get down on your knees and speak to God first because he made your brain, okay? And then ask him to give you directions, clear directions, on how to, how to eat, how to make better choices. Um, you don't have to follow what I say, but take cognizance of what I'm saying and then go and find your own answers. For me, following the natural way principles worked. I have to exercise on a daily basis. For me, it's, it's, it's totally, I mean, it's just, I need to exercise, it's part of who I am. But at the same time, following a healthy diet has made such an enormous difference. If it hadn't been for me having a relationship with God, I probably wouldn't have got down on my knees and asked him for wisdom. And I believe that he's given me that wisdom. And I believe that the wisdom he gave me is available for every single person out there. You just have to ask and then take responsibility and start looking at your diet. I'm not telling you to throw your, your pills away. I'm not telling you to do that. Just start getting your life together, get your diet together, start exercising and start making a conscious decision to work on getting somebody, to your doctor, to wean you off the medication you are on. If you have a doctor who says you can't come off it, find a doctor who will help you and there are doctors out there. Just, I just believe me when I say that changing your diet can set you free because it set me free.